The new Sorento is a game changer for Kia. But the big question is, who's gonna pay more than 60 grand for any flagship wearing a Kia badge? The curse of being an up and coming car maker is that the cars on sale now always lag behind the brand's reputation. The product might be worth nine out of 10 today, but people will still think it's in the sixes. Kia has significant reputational opprobrium to overcome, but the new Sorento could easily be Kia's Redemption X Machina. Here are the top six reasons why the new Sorento is a real winner. But don't worry, this review is not a Sorento suck. I'll be telling you exactly what you'll hate as well. Hyundai is very worried about Sorento because it raises the bar and it puts Santa Fe under significant pressure. Sorento is 90 millimetres longer than Santa Fe and 80 of those millimetres is between the wheels. That means access and legroom for passengers is going to be objectively superior in Sorento. If you're carrying your kids, their friends, your friends and your relatives, or any combination of those vehicular hangers on, that's gonna be an important consideration. Let's compare Highlander and Platinum. The Sorento is gonna cost you $2,750 more. So let's leave our personalities at the door and all think like accountants. Is there a net return on investment for your almost 3,000 bucks extra? Sorento is longer, as noted, but they're both running the same powertrain. Sorento's in front on warranty, but Santa Fe claws back some ground on capped price service and longer complimentary roadside assistance. Santa Fe also has automated reverse parking, and the Kia doesn't. I did a full test on that system, it was great. Made me look like a comprehensive parallel parking peanut. Bastards. Seriously, it's a pretty good system if you don't mind being humiliated by a robot. The $3,000 question here is active safety. Sorrento has blind spot monitoring, which you can live without, especially if you adjust the mirrors properly. But it's also got adaptive cruise control, and that's a huge plus on congested freeways. So all up, you'd have to conclude that Sorrento more than passes the objective value test. That extra dough is definitely worth the investment. It's good value. Adaptive cruise and that longer wheelbase would do it for me. Santa Fe, and I'm a huge Santa Fe fan, is copping a real squeeze right now. And that's great news if you want to buy one. Sorrento squeezing from above and the new Hyundai Tucson is putting on the pressure from below. Tucson has some equipment that Santa Fe lacks, like adaptive cruise, go figure. So it's a card carrying certainty that Hyundai is gonna move in the next few months to add adaptive cruise and probably some other active safety stuff as well to Santa Fe. They're not confirming it yet, but it's a done deal. Trust me on this. And the only remaining question is, what will happen to the price? Sorrento is certainly not cheap but it is good value. When you look at vehicles like the Land Rover Discovery Sport, the commercial philosophy is completely different. You can buy the poverty pack of Disco Sport for within $1,000 of the Sorrento Platinum, but it is a poverty pack. If you wanna feel like a peasant, albeit a peasant driving a very pleasant looking SUV, buy the Disco Sport TD4 SE. As commercial propositions go, the base disco sport is like retaining a dozen Bangkok hookers. Everything you really want is gonna cost extra. The big alloys, the high intensity lights, the third seating row, stuff like that. Every time you tick one of those boxes, it's gonna cost you another two grand. It's very easy to get seduced by these notionally sexier SUVs. They're all doing it. Audi is a gold medal winning specialist at docking their Vorsprung der Technik vacuum cleaner up to your bank account. 
and they do it very effectively. You walk into the dealership expecting to pay, I don't know, 60 grand, and you will emerge from these delightful institutions with telltale bruising and tearing in a certain intimate area and more like 90,000 bucks lighter of pocket. It's a vulgar, egregious process. But when you buy a Sorento, the price you expect to pay is much more in line with the price you actually pay. What you see and what you pay are not too far apart. Alternatively, you could buy the poverty pack of Tuaregs. Of course, you'd need another 12 grand just to get in the door there. And there's no question the Sorento's engine is doing a much better job with basically the same outputs from 25% less capacity. And you only get five seats with the Tuareg as well as a staggering four years less warranty. Of course, the Sorento has bigger alloys, a proximity key and a better audio system and a full-sized alloy spare. The Tuareg's got a space saver. Go figure. I'm not that big on implied status of this and that, but at its most generous, I think you could probably prosecute the case that being made in Slovakia is on a similar rung of the reputational ladder as being made in South Korea. I'm guessing. Because the Tuareg is about as authentically German as me. And there's Volkswagen's notorious commitment to reliability and customer satisfaction to consider. Hard to put a price on that. At least, a positive price. You know, you could take the badges off the Sorento and convince a great many people that it was actually a Volkswagen. Blind man's bluff. What do you think of the new Tuareg? But if you did that, you probably also couldn't convince the same people they were actually in a Kia. Reality always lags behind reputation. If you look at the Poverty Pack Sorento, it's line ball on price with the base model Toyota Kluger. And people will say, Toyota versus Kia? No brainer. But if you lose the spin, they're both front drive V6 petrols with about the same performance. The Kluger's made in the States, and I'm not sure the US does a better job than South Korea bolting anything together. The Sorento's got four more years warranty again, GPS and electric park brake, tire pressure monitoring, climate air conditioning, and front parking sensors to match the ones at the rear. The Poverty Kluger is rear sensors only. Objectively, you've got to give this round to the Sorento as well. When you look at or jump in a Sorento, it looks and feels premium. It just does. Soft touch surfaces, premium materials, integrated design, generally. You get 80% Audi for a third of the price. One of the smartest things that that mob at Kia ever did was poach Peter Schreyer, the bloke who designed the Audi TT. Peter Schreyer is the reason why Kias look so good today. And of course, he went on to do bigger and better things at Hyundai Kia. You've got that neat three-spoke wheel that says Audi and the tiny airbag module in the hub that says Porsche. You've got the upmarket instruments too, and you get almost none of that dipshit design that says, I don't know, we were inspired by the hydrodynamics of mating porpoises or something which South Koreans were so good at being so bad at a decade ago. I mean, look me in the eye and tell me a Nissan Pathfinder looks this good. Let's have a bit of F-U-N. I like having fun because it pulls car companies' pants down. What else could you buy from House of SUV for mid 50 thousands? There's Ford Territory Titanium Diesel, a great choice if you hate yourself. If you're a masochist, the sadists at Ford will inflict the outdated territory on you with the world's dodgiest diesel engine. And you'll hate it. And you'll love that. Same outputs as the Sorento 2.2, but from a much bigger, thirstier and older Jurassic Park Jaguar engine. The territory is of course built by people who all know they're losing their jobs. What a great environment for fostering engineering excellence, and it's $2,000 more. If you're on a budget, there's always the Captiva 7 LTZ. The price is right, but frankly, everything else about this SUV is just 
wrong. Captiva is a disaster everywhere between the bumpers and from the roof to the road. It's the pin-up girl for everything that's wrong with Holden magazine. Alternatively, I guess, you could just buy a truck battery and a set of jumper leads and attach those to your testicles for the next three years. Ultimately, that would prove to be not quite as painful and a lot less traumatic. Grand Cherokee Laredo Diesel is line ball on price. And okay, it's a poverty pack and just a five seater. But it's got style. I mean, it looks good and it goes great. You'd look good in a Grand Cherokee. Everyone does. Unfortunately, it's also a Jeep, which is like loading up three or four chambers in your grandpappy's Colt 45 Peacemaker and playing a game of reliability. Correction, Russian roulette. Mazda CX-9 Luxury, that's a starter as well. I mean, who doesn't want the oldest Mazda in the range? The one without all the latest Skyactiv technology. The one that's been crying out for replacement for about three or four years now. The one that drinks like a sailor on shore leave and is almost guaranteed to sink without a trace, at least in terms of resale value, as soon as the new one gets released. And finally, the mid-spec Pathfinder STL. Same price as Sorrento Platinum. Of course, it's Japanese too, but it's still 14 grand away from being the Pathfinder flagship and it comes with that delightful JATCO CVT. You know, the one that's been shitting itself all over the world for the past couple of years now. The one Renault Nissan boss Carlos Gozen arced up over so monumentally. A real transvestite transmission. Always in the wrong gear. Nissan says it's implemented the Dr. Frankenfurter fix, you know, jump to the left, step to the right. So they're all good now. Nothing to worry about. It's all good. Kia's pretty much turned around its former reputation for poor resale value. I did the research on that a few weeks back. It's highly unlikely the Sorrento is going to burn you at trade-in time. And it's pretty clear getting more bums on seats is going to be the key to turning consumer sentiment around as well. So take a Sorrento for a test drive and see what you think objectively. Leave your preconceptions about the brand at the door. Sorrento is certainly not perfect. So let's talk about exactly where it is less than perfect. The V6, which is available in SI and SLI, but not platinum, is not available with all wheel drive. And it so easily overwhelms all available grip at the front end if you get too enthusiastic with your right foot. It's always chirping the front wheels. The diesel does seem expensive too, at three and a half thousand bucks extra. But you have to put in perspective that this price also includes stepping up from front drive to all wheel drive. That's a lot of extra beneficial hardware for the price. So I think we'll let that one go through to the keeper. The steering wheel is absolutely horrible. Anyone who thinks it's a good idea to have a highly polished 60 degree fake wood crown on a steering wheel on any car in the 21st century is so out of touch with reality that they might as well be a politician. The base SI Sorrento is the only one that lacks this so-called luxury accoutrement, but the SLI and Platinum, really? Apart from looking terrible and feeling worse and reflecting the sun in your eyes, apart from that, it's a really nice touch. There's also a multi-drive mode doohickey with normal, eco and sport modes, which allegedly changes the shift points and the throttle response and the steering weight in concert with whatever setting you choose. These changes are, at best, minor. <laughs> it's a complete waste of space. And then there's towing. Two tonnes is a lot, no doubt about that. But here in Australia, we have this mentally retarded attitude to static tow ball download, and it is not reflected anywhere else in the world. So a lot of people in Australia are going to expect a 200 kilo download limit, but they're going to get 100. And that's going to be a real deal breaker. I know you can change the way you load the trailer and reduce the download somewhat, but a lot of blue singlet bozos failed physics. 
and they're just not going to accept that 100 kilos is more than adequate for a two-ton trailer. And Kia has discontinued its load assist kit accessory, which pumped up the limit to 150 kilos, which seems at face value like a step backwards in the towing department, especially if you've turned off your brain on the issue of statics and dynamics. There's been some criticism by the bigger wood ducks in motoring journalism, in my view, to the effect that Sorento doesn't handle like a BMW M3. Knock me down with a feather. Motoring journalists are generally borderline idiots, and this is exhibit A. In fact, you don't put your ageing parents and your young kids in your seven-seat SUV and then head off to set the lap record around the Nürburgring. And if you do, they should lead you away in handcuffs and deal with you North Korean style. Sorento actually has excellent local suspension tuning and it's been set up just right for a seven-person conveyance. It's also safe with a five-star ANCAP crashworthiness rating earning an astonishing 36.62 points out of a possible 37 in these very demanding and truly independent safety assessments. If you're in the market for a Sorento or anything else, contact me at autoexpert.com.au. I'll help you save thousands buying the right vehicle at the right price, and you'll sidestep a car dealer's typically reprehensible tricks and traps. And we all know how emotionally uplifting and spiritually fulfilling it is at a car dealership right? Don't forget to subscribe for regular updates and leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. I'm John Cadogan. Thanks for watching.